that I was asked to tell stories about was a good one for me because uh, Laura asked me to tell about uh, somebody, a woman, that inspired me. And I have several in my life, but this one uh, in particular. And that's because uh, I'm telling her life story. It's a long story and you're only going to get a snippet of it. But uh, this might just tell you how and why I admire her so much. And it's about a woman, a Danish woman. And we meet her in a dark, dark place in her life. Because she is sitting on her suitcase in a freight wagon in the dark. And all around her, she can more feel than hear all the other people crammed in that wagon. Some are standing up, some are sitting. It's cold. She's sitting on her suitcase. And her name is Ilm, Ilm Nilsen. She's 56 years old at this point. And the reason why it's cold is because it's December 1944. And this freight wagon is not the only wagon in that train. It's a freight train with freight wagons. And each and every wagon is filled with humans like pigs on the way to the slaughterhouse. But these are humans. They don't know exactly where they are, but they know that they're in the northern part of Germany. And Ellen, the woman on the suitcase, she's sitting there thinking about her life, thinking about how she ended up right there at that point of time. Because when the war started, of course she hated the Nazis. And of course she hated the occupation of Denmark. But she had greater problems at that time because her husband had fallen ill and he lay coughing, coughing all day and all night in her tiny house in the tiny town of Drauer, in the southern part of Amma, a little town where everybody knew each other or, even better so, were related. And there he was, coughing. All her children, six of them, had moved away from home. And his coughing got worse. And then it stopped. And he died just after the war came. And she was widowed and the house got so silent. So she asked her son, John, and, his, and her daughter-in-law, Esther, if they wanted to move in with her because then she would have a bit of life in the house. And they said yes. And she continued her work because she was a working woman a working class woman and a working woman. She had a horrible job, a hard job. She was a fishmonger in Copenhagen here, down at Gammelstrand. Together with all other women, they would stand there every day outside in rain and sunshine and sell their fish. And she would continue doing that so, the war was just something annoying. The war was more or less just a, an extra task, an extra annoying thing in her life. Until September 1943, it was a cold month in Denmark. And at the end of September, one of the last days, some of her regular customers came. It was two brothers, they have a flower shop at Gammelstrand, and they came to her and they said, Il Nielsen, uh, we're wondering if you could help us. Yes, she said, of course I can. What do you want? 
No, 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 they said, it's not that. We need to get to Sweden. Sweden wasn't the part of the war. Why do you need to go to Sweden, she said, whispering so the other mongers wouldn't hear it. We need to go because we're Jews. Why do you want to go to Sweden because you're Jews, she said. Haven't you heard? No. Of course she hadn't heard. It wasn't on the official news. It wasn't something that everybody knew. But once you knew it, you thought that everybody else knew it. And the reason was this. Denmark had the boss Nazi. And his name was Werner Best. And he had just taken the role. And there had been riots in August. And the government had resigned. And now there was a crisis. And in this crisis, Werner Best, he won it to show Adolf Hitler that he was a great man. And he knew just the way to do it. He found out that he wanted to deport all the Danish Jews. And he was an experienced man in that task because he was the one that actually deported all the Jews from Paris. This was done in a really hard manner. But there was some problems in Denmark because the Jews that lived in Denmark, never wanted, no one t thought of them as Jews. They were just humans. They were just the neighbor. They, was just, they had assimilated themselves so much, so never, no one talked about them or thought about them. There was no anti-Semitism in Denmark at that point. And then he got an idea. So he whispered to some key persons that he was going to make a raid on the 1st of October. 1943, that would be the date where all the Danish Jews were to be deported to concentration camps in Germany. And that was why these two brothers were standing there asking for help. She was shocked about that news. What? She said. It can't be true. It is. We have to go away. We don't know where to go. And then we thought of you. You, you are from Kauai, you must know of, of so, some fisher, fishermen. Yes, I do, she said. So, can you help us? Now she's sitting on that suitcase, thinking about that yes. It didn't come from the brain. No, it came from the heart. Of course it came from the heart. Yes, of course I'll help. Of course I will. I'm a decent person. Of course I'll help. She said, actually, I think I'll, I'll shut the shop down for today and you come with me. Because nobody of my friends are going to be deported that way. No way. Come with me and I'll take you out to Drawe and we'll find a solution. And they went with her. And she asked her nephew, who was a fisherman. And he said, yeah. Come, you can come tonight at eight. We're already doing this every night. We're helping Jews to the city of Limham or Klagsham in Sweden. And there's room for yours as well. And the next week, she rescued about 50 to 70 Jews. And then there was a raid. And then that stopped. But then her nephew came and he said, well, auntie, it's not only humans that we need to hide and, well, I'm talking about legal weapons, auntie. Uh, I thought, we, could we hide them in your shed? Yes, of course. You come with them and I'll hide them. That was okay, because nobody noticed until July 44 when she was arrested and Gestapo, they knew everything, everything. She was sentenced to death, but a fault in the administration uh, made room for her that she didn't get killed, no. She went by train to Fröslu, a Danish camp. And from Fröslu, 
to this place on her suitcase, traveling to a destiny unknown to her. And she was thinking about what to do and where they were going. She was also thinking about that she was hungry. She had a little crumb of bread in her pocket and she thought to herself, I might just leave it for a bit. You never know. You never know. And little shit did she know. Suddenly the train stopped and she could hear shouting in German and she could hear dogs barking and suddenly the door flew open and they couldn't really see because their eyes had been in the dark for so long and they were hauled down from the wagon and they were German watch women in long black coats with fearful dogs in one hand and clubs in the others and they would yell and there she learned that here nobody would speak to you they would yell they would scream they would spit you in the face and onwards and forward they moved her with her suitcase and they came to an open place with a big big iron gate and there was a word. It said Ravensbrück, a big, big camp. And there was a prisoner in striped clothes. And they were moving some dirt under surveillance of these watchwomen with their dogs and their clubs. And one of them just went just right past Ellen. And she looked up at her and did like this. And Ellen looked down at that prisoner. She looked horrible. She had just no fat at all. She was just like a ghost. And she was all dirty all over. And her hair, she had nothing. She was bald. And she was just put her arm up there, her hand begging. <laughs> And Ellen, he, she took her, her bread from the pocket, thinking about, oh my God, she must be hungry that way. She didn't even realize that it, with this would be her in just a few weeks. And they went in. And this is where my story ends for now, but I'll tell you how it ends. Because this is nightmare. But she get rescued a few months later by the White Buses, an initiative made by the Danish and the Swedish and the Norwegian Red Cross, where they came down to Germany and rescued all the Danish and the Norse and uh, Norwegian uh, uh, resistance women and men. And they also came to Armsburg and she was rescued just as she was dying. And she came back to Trauer that summer of 45 <coughs> and she lived 20 years more in the daytime a life where she didn't talk about her horrible horrible experiences but at night time part of her soul was back there every single night so this woman means a lot to me I tell her story and I hold her name up high as a torch in these dark times of Denmark, Western Europe and North America. I do hold her name up high as a torch. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you a very, very, very short story. Um, once I was uh, asked to do a small story to tell what a story is like when you tell it. And you can only do it for two minutes. And I thought that was a bit of a challenge. So I went about and I thought about it and I came up with this story. And uh, talking about muses 
this story is about one. We're going way down south. Way down south where the seawater turns from green to blue. And by the sea, there is a small forgotten town. Of course, with a harbor like the palm of a hand. And then this wonderful little town. It has these steep, steep streets. And the buildings, the houses, have been painting blue or yellow. Once they were bright, now they're faded. And in this sweet little forgotten village, well, it's a Thursday and it's right afternoon. And there's this old man walking with his stick, with his walking stick. He has been walking down to the harbor to stand there and look. To stand there, just wondering if everything is the same as yesterday, and it, sure it is. There might be a seagull, there might be something else, and he just stands there. And then, when he's been standing there for a while, he turns around, and then he walks slowly with his walking stick up the steep, steep street. And suddenly he stops. This very day, this Thursday, right afternoon, he stops and his walking stick grows roots. And the reason why he stopped is because he remembered something. He remembered the name of the first woman he ever had. He was 13 years old. And he was the youngest member of a sailor's crew. And they all got ashore on the North African shore. And he, well, he had longings in his heart. And he had horizons behind his eyes. And he had money and a lot of it in his purse. So he went into the souk and in one of the smallest corridors, there was this wonderful girl sitting in a doorway, smiling at him, her laconic smile. And her name, her name was Fasana. And he whispers it. And as he whispers her name, he can just again feel the wonderful softness of her skin, her olive-colored skin. And he takes just one finger and just runs his finger up her arm, just runs it very slowly, whispering her name, Fasana. And then he falls over and dies. And the women of this town, they say, now there, there was a God-fearing man. If there ever was one, he was it. Look, just look at the way he died. He died with a smile on his face and a finger pointing up towards God. <laughs> Very small story. Thank you.